In the last video, check the description for a link, I introduced recurrent neural networks. I kind of did it in a silly toy example, sentiment analysis, with hand-engineered feature vectors. I introduce RNNs this way because I think it's a useful approach to understand how an RNN can work and the kind of states that it can build up as you process a sentence. And this helps you get up to speed on some of the exciting developments that we've seen with neural language models. But my example wasn't realistic. Most people use these types of models for language modeling. That's why they're called language models. So let's talk about the language modeling task. A language model takes a prefix or context of a sentence and spits out a distribution over what the next token observation will be. These are used for autocomplete machine translation and for some of the cool generative AI applications that we've seen recently. We'll be talking more about those later. This is all very abstract, so let's be concrete here and go through an example. Let's say that you have the song lyric from Benny Bell. I have a sad story to tell you. It may hurt your feelings a bit. Last night when I walked into my bathroom, I stepped in a big pile of... So what we're going to do is try to predict what the next token could be and think about the clues and the data that we could use to predict what the next token could be. And of course the correct answer is Shaving Cream, the title of the Benny Bell song that we're quoting here. Now we're focusing on neural language models, but for contrast, let's compare to the good old days and how these sorts of things used to be done. The simplest way to do this is look at a large text database and look at all of the contexts that begin with some prefix, let's say stepped in a big pile of, and then the probability of token W being the next token that completes that prefix is proportional to the count of the contacts that start with stepped in a big pile of and end with that token W. But this of course has problems. Often you get zero counts for longer contacts. Maybe you've never seen this particular phrase before and you need to figure out how sticky particular sequences are and, and so on. We're not talking about that now, but if you're curious about how to do the counting right, I have a link to the video in the description below about Pittman your language models. So if you move beyond counting, you can use something that looks a lot like logistic regression. You could build features that describe the prefix and then use some sort of stochastic gradient descent to learn the weights that, when multiplied by the features, best recreate the token distribution on some training data. You could get creative with those features. Those features could recreate the counts from the Ingram models that I talked about before, or you could do fancier things like check to see if you're in a song and at the end of the line if the words rhyme with each other. That could help us predict words that rhyme with bit in the example that we saw before. You could include the topic of the document, for example, substances you'd encounter in a bathroom. People came up with all sorts of clever features for these sparse feature vectors that do a good job of predicting the next word in this language modeling task. But by now you've probably already figured out what I'm going to say next. If we use a dense distributed representation, it can do a better job of predicting the next token. And that's what happens if you train an RNN to do language modeling. Let's dig into how that works a little bit more. We have our RNN as usual. Each observation is a token. We learn an initial history H0, and then for each time step after that, a token appears. We turn that combined with the previous hidden state into a new hidden state. And then from that hidden state, we predict a token. For the sake of concreteness, let's say that this is a linear transformation parameterized by Ws. Unlike our handcrafted hidden states with five states for the sentiment example, to do anything really useful, you're going to need a hidden state with a much bigger dimension d, in the hundreds perhaps, and you'd need to turn this into a v-dimensional distribution because you're going to need, at the end of the day, a probability for each item in your vocabulary. So your token prediction matrix is d by v. 
And then after you multiply those two together, you take the softmax over that vector to get your distribution over words. Your training objective is to maximize the log probability of the correct next token. This conception of the RNN was proposed back in the 80s, but it didn't really take off as something that actually worked until the 2010s. Why is that? Well, let's think about what happens when you do backpropagation in a network like this applied to real data. First, a sequence can be pretty long, particularly if you're modeling at the character level. But the backpropagation technique is essentially unbounded. Every hidden state has some role to play in the prediction of the most recent token. And thus, it gets some blame from backpropagation for any error that's made at any point in the sequence. So that means when we do the chain rule, we're going to have to backpropagate the error for yt plus 1 to the previous hidden state and the previous hidden token representation, but that hidden state is an interpolation of the previous hidden state and the token representation passed through our nonlinearity, and we have to backprop one more time, and so on and so on and so on. Depending on how big the sequences are and the norms of the underlying matrix W, we can end up with very small or very large gradients because the chain rule is essentially exponentiating our parameter matrix W. I'm not going to go through the full proof here, but hopefully you can get an intuition of why that might happen. And hopefully you can also see that if those gradients are too big or too small, it can screw up classic gradient descent. If your gradients are too big, you'll jump around and not converge. If your gradients are too small, you just won't move at all. But you need to have long range dependencies for language modeling. Let's say that you have the sentence, Jane walked into the room with John, who wasn't paying attention to what was going on. After poking him to get his attention, John said hi to For this to work, the model needs to go all the way back to Jane to give high weights to tokens like her or Jane. Okay, so how do you fix this problem so that your gradients don't get too big or too small, but you can still capture these long range dependencies? To fix exploding gradients, you can just set a threshold. If the gradient gets above that threshold, you just cap or clip the gradient at that threshold. There's a nice analysis from Pascanau et al. 2013 that shows how this happens. But if you don't do gradient clipping, stochastic gradient descent can send you jumping on crazy trajectories in your parameter space. Here we have the parameters w and b, and then you have this huge jump in the parameter space. But if you do gradient clipping, then you end up with a much saner trajectory that your model can actually learn. Now what about the vanishing gradient problem? I've been using ReLU not just because that it makes math easier for our examples, but because it's asymmetric. It zeroes out small values, but does nothing to normal values. If you use this very simple activation function and initialize your Ws to the identity matrix, both of these things together go a long way to helping prevent small gradients. So let's say that you've implemented all of those things and you learn some neural language models. What do the representations look like? There's a great paper from Karpathy et al. that gives examples of some of the hidden states of character-based, not token or word-based neural networks that they trained on novels and source code. So let's take a look at the value of individual dimensions, individual cells of the hidden state. When we show a figure, each character will be colored with the activation of one dimension, one cell. Blue is low, red is high. Here's one that keeps track of how far you are from the end of the line, because there are explicit carriage returns in the data that they used. Here's another one that turns on when you're inside a dialog, as set off by quote marks. Looking at code is even more fun. Here's a cell that turns on only inside an if statement. Here's another that turns on for comments and strings, things that look more like English than a computer programming language. 
going back to the history of language models, this is the kind of stuff that's possible with log linear language models. You could have defined a feature for each of those things. But what's even better is that you didn't have to do that. The computer, or more precisely the model plus optimizer after seeing the data, discovers features that do a good job of predicting what the next observation is going to be. But what's really interesting is that the underlying language modeling task turns out to be a really good springboard to more complicated problems, as we'll see when the neural language models get bigger and bigger. To understand those models, you need to first understand these simpler language models and how they learn from data. This is just one video from a course that I'm teaching. If you want to get the whole context, check out the course webpage linked below. There you can find all of the videos in the right order. YouTube likes to show you older videos out of order, homeworks, exercises, and recommended readings. And if you want to help other people find videos like this, please be sure to like and subscribe to provide a big gradient to the algorithm.